I want to formally um, formally invite you to, to this talk that I have been looking forward to for some time. Um, Vanessa German is um, such a light, such a light um, in her work and in her activism and in her lectures. And um, as I've told some of you, every single minute I spend in the presence, virtual or real, of Vanessa is a uh, is a moment that my life is getting better and that I am becoming a better person in the world. So um, I hope that you have that same experience. I think that you will. Um, and this special event is hosted by ENEON, which is the um, museums, which is a group of deeply engaged museum supporters that help um, fund a range of programs, exhibitions, acquisitions, and other key programs of the museum. Um, all while creating a dynamic group of folks like the one that's assembled here and getting to um, have access to really interesting people doing really interesting things through the medium of glass, which is what the Corning Museum of Glass and all of its splendor is about. So um, ENEON members, welcome. Thank you for being here. And those of you that are not ENEON members, if you want to be, that information is on our website. Or if you'd like to be a member at any level, we welcome you, or if you just want to give us some cha-ching, that's also okay. I won't turn you away. I don't think the museum will. Um, uh, but really, all of you are welcome here to experience this in incredible moment. So one last story, um, the story of how I first encountered Vanessa and her work. It was uh, four years ago. It was at um, the Museum of American Glass at Wheaton Village in New Jersey. They have a show called Emanations that brings a range of folks to work with glass, make glass and install it in their museum, which is mostly, um, I don't think uh, too many of my curatorial colleagues are on here, but you know, I know Carol is. Anyway, mostly old stuff, delightful old stuff. I was walking through the galleries and I turned a corner and there was Vanessa's work in all its glory. And the glory that it was, was this parade of figures and you will see them um, on a glittery gold ground with, uh, with black and white and so much blue. And I was like, what is this? This is incredible. It, it's such a full expression. Um, and you will get to experience some of that full expression right now. So last little bit before I um, pass, pass the, the, the world over to Vanessa, um, please keep yourselves on mute during the talk. Um, and it's best viewed in shared screen plus speaker, which we'll send out in the chat that's up at the, up at the top when, um, It'll become an option once Vanessa starts sharing screen. So everybody, without further ado, and with advance, thanks to you, Vanessa, um, for sharing yourself and your work with us today. Um, here's Vanessa. Greetings, everyone. How are you? Um, I am asking that question seriously. <laughs> um, so wherever you are in the world, I wish you well and your people well. I'm here and there's a dog next to me named Judy and she doesn't wanna be on the screen right now. So there's, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on Seneca Nation land, Haudenosaunee land that was violently taken from uh, the Seneca Nation people who still exist. And I'm in the hood, I'm in a neighborhood called Homewood in a house that houses my studio also. And I'm a black woman and I'm wearing a sort of khaki greenish olive colored beanie on my head. And <laughs> I'm wearing a, a dark blue denim button down shirt and I'm wearing an earring that is a Brazilian blue butterfly wing and another earring that one of the kids at the art house made that has a lot of blue in it and I have a sort of heart-shaped face and a gap between my teeth that's me and I'm excited to be here with you all today wherever you are and on the land that you're on and with whatever um, in whatever space that your heart is in I'm glad that we're able to be here together today I'm going to um, uh, I'm going to share some images with you and share some language with you about those images and about myself. And what you should know is that um, my process is a process of wholeness and it is a process of revelation. So um, 
there's going to be a degree of both intimacy and informality to this talk. So if you have questions, ask the questions at any time. I should see them pop up on the screen, but there will be time for questions and answers at the end. But I'm really um, interested in your curiosity. So if, I, if I'm at an image or if I say something and your curiosity um, sort of ignites, ask the question right then because it could possibly take us to a place that I would not engineer us to be able to go. And I might need to go to that place too. So um, ask questions at any time. Judy, do you wanna say hi? Hi, everybody. And uh, so, like I said, intimacy, <laughs> intensity, and informality bringing us to, um, you know, caring for the wholeness of ourselves and inside of this process. So, thanking Susie and everyone at the Corning Museum and to uh, sending a special shout out of love to all the artists out there. Um, I, I believe in the power of art. And so I hope that you are well and that you're um, doing what you need to do to be yourself and to bring your work out into the world that we're in. So I'm going to share screen right now. And I thank you all again for this time. It takes a lot of emails to make things like this happen. So I'm grateful. All right, let us begin. I love the internet. <laughs> so I begin this talk with uh, the phrase, I believe in the power of art. And I'm beginning with this phrase because uh, I will return over and over again to this idea of art having power and asking the work to do something. So for those of you who love art, for those of you who both love and make art and share spaces where there's art, um, what do you believe about the power of art and how are you allowing that power to do what you believe can be done? And are you pushing that? Are you being courageous with it? Are you pushing it into another place? So I am, um, I begin with, I believe in the power of art because it really is um, a really large part of the skirt of my process, understanding for me and my wholeness and my humanity that something is happening to me when I'm making art and that uh, it is more powerful than anybody ever told me when in teaching anything or learning any place. So I believe in the power of art. I have given myself the title citizen artist. I'm working in human technologies and I'll talk about what that is, but I'm wondering, like, do you have an idea? Like, do you have a language of understanding about what human technology is for you? And I'm centering dimensional wholeness. So I said that already. I believe in the power of art and this talk is centered um, in the wholeness of, of myself and humans as whole entire beings, right? That I should even have to say that. So just beginning in acknowledgement of my ancestors and in acknowledgement of um, my mother who I'm a self-taught artist, but being a self-taught artist really means that you're always learning, that the horizon of your imagination and your intellectual processes is always open and it's bringing the learning in from everywhere all the time and then there's a process of excavating clarity like the clearest information that I need for my process as a self-taught artist um, but it also means that I got my first PhD basically from my mother who uh, was a fiber artist and the work that you see on the screen the um, the textile work is my mother's work. My mother was the first person to really introduce me to different levels of art. Um, so we, I grew up in a house that had uh, like really fine art level portraits always of women, sculptures of women, uh, but also folk artwork. Like my mother surrounded us with a lot of um, really the only images of black womanhood that I saw being reflected back at me as a child and my mother introduced me to the Black Madonna, which is an important part of my work. And you'll see some of that. And in the center of this photograph, you'll see a Black woman in a Black dress in a cotton field in Alabama, surrounded by three um, sort of lighter skinned young Black women. 
This is the oldest image that we have in my family of any of my ancestors. And I acknowledge them because being a self-taught artist means that I'm also really mining and ex excavating what is already here, that which is already inside of me. And how do I um, open up the uh, layers and the sort of textures of information and wisdom that just exists by dint of my body. So that's a really important part of my process. What is already here? What wants to come out? And it's a really important part of my process being um, a black person on a, this land in America to, to actually take very seriously the wisdom that exists already inside of my being, being that I am a black person on a land where um, you know, the found, at the founding of this land, uh, somebody who was like me was never imagined to be full or to be a whole human being. We know about three fifths of, of, of a person, but there was also this way that in the imagination, if I think about whose imagination I'm living in right now, I'm living inside of the reality of imagination of mostly white men who never imagined that I would live on this land with freedom and resources. So really giving myself the agency to mine my soul as a resource is a, a, an act of radical wholeness on this land and it's an important part of my process and then there's me as a little black girl in Los Angeles I grew up in Los Angeles California in the 80s and 90s and I grew up in a way um, that was really interesting because my mother had five kids and she got sick of us touching her sometimes use all these little hands on her um, and she would drop us off at the museum. She would piece us out at like 8.45 at the LA County Museum Complex and she would pick us up with the museum closed. So museums are really important to me because they showed me, um, they, they talked to me about how institutions uh, with that have objects and collections tell you stories and how they tell you what's important. So I, um, like I said, intensity, intimacy and informality in this talk to go to the places that are necessary for us to go. Um, so how, to, how you get to choose how not to die. This is a really important thing that I had to come to understand early in my life because when I say I believe in the power of art, my belief in the power of art came at the, at the sort of cliff of life and death. I was really thinking about, um, I was really feeling um, in my whole being about how um, I was not able to sink into my life in a way that ever um, released me into a current of ease. So I was really confused about how to be alive and how to stay alive and how to stay alive and stay well in this world. And so I gave myself, I was going to end my own life. I gave myself six months to live. But in that six months, I sort of did this experiment on myself where I said, let's see, let's just see what happens, Vanessa. If you live every day doing exactly what you want to do, which I, I said this to a woman once and she was like, what do you think the world is? Like, you think you just get to do what you want? You gotta like struggle, suffer, get your mortgage and like weep over your car payment every month, just like everybody else. And I was like, I, I wanna see if it's possible to actually live a life easing into the current of my own humanity. So every day for six months, I would walk my dog and I would pick up things off the ground in my neighborhood and I would take them down to this little damp basement that I had in, um, in my house and I would stack wood and I would move these materials around. So what you're looking at right here is one of the efforts that came from this six month period of time that I chose uh, that I decided to see if I could live my life and really stay alive doing what felt right. Um, which for me, what came through that time was this language of materiality and the happening, the thing that happened to my body when I was in the process of making things. So this is called Power Figure to Keep Me Alive. And it was in, uh, it's in the Progressive Collection right now. And what this work taught me and this way of working, of uh, working instinctively and working soulfully and working with a degree of trust that was really never affirmed externally from my being, what that really, taught me was that I could decide myself how I would stay alive and how I would be inside of my life. And in this period of time when I was making this work, I would listen to Alice Walker's books on tape and I would listen to Dr. King and I would listen to Dr. King talk about love. 
And I realized that love is this entire ecosystem. And I had really found a universe of that inside of my studio and in, in moving these materials around and transforming them into figures that I would intentionally put a purpose inside of the object. And that purpose would drive the entire process. That purpose would really be the sky that held um, the light of a single work of art through a process. So if I wanted to make something to keep me alive, then I would like write it on pieces of paper and wrap it up into some of the sort of bundles that you see on there and it would carry me through the process of making the work. So power figure to keep me alive. I believe in the power of art because it literally saved my, saved my life. Uh, so this work, if you look at it, just look at, look, at, look at it and see some of the things that are familiar to you. Like, what do you see? Um, and know that everything that's in the work is purposeful for me. So even the nails on uh, the corona on the figure, I would pick up nails outside of my mother's studio and I showed a small power figure that I made at a summer festival. And this scholar said, hey, you're doing that thing they do in the Congo. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they said, you should do some research. And so in doing research, I found images like these, like this is um, a Congo and Kisi power figure that's in the collection of the Met. And I realized that that way of releasing myself into the current of like my own soul um, and working creatively and um, with a spirit of power and the transformation of when I'm transforming materials that I, I realized that I was doing things quite naturally and quite instinctively that had been done for thousands of years. And so I started entering into this process where I wanted to figure out what was already inside of me, what was already happening. So I wanted to know what was in my body. I wanted to know about my instincts. I wanted to know about my earthliness and my connection to things. So. I would make these works of art and then I would have this Gullah Geechee expert come to my house and come to my studio and, and I would say, hey, look at this, I made this. Have you ever seen anything like this before? And they would sort of read the work backwards and they would say, well, I know that mirrors are used in these power figures for this reason and the nails mean this and putting things on pedestals the way that you're like elevating the work so much, that means something else. And, and they would say, well, Vanessa, why did you do these things? And so I would have this process that was uh, really mining my heart and mining my soul and then I would bring somebody else in and to say where's this from and then it would I would meet what the information they gave me with my own reasons and develop this process that was really revelatory so tar baby on a pig on a box with an N. So this is an early work of mine. It's a small, single, discrete artwork. It's in the collection of the Wadsworth Athenaeum. And the thing about this work of art, looking at it again after almost 20 years, is that I realized in looking at my earlier work, what I was doing in ways that I couldn't see before. I realized that I was really thinking and feeling about the Black body in a way that was sacred and powerful, magical, and um, sort of um, I would always insert my rage into the works. So there's a reason that it's Tar Baby on a pig, on a box with an N. And because I needed to have a way to express things that I, when I looked around me and I saw other black women, other black femmes, other people expressing some of the rage that they had expressed, they would get killed, they would get beat up, they would, they would not make it through safely. So I found myself inserting lots of secret um, lots of secret rage and lots of secret love into these figures that were about affirming and lifting up the bodies of my own body, you know, and so one of the things in these smaller works is I'm really contending with the life and the body of Black women, and I realized looking through these early works that the first messages that I received about my Black body as a child were to hate my body. And through all of these incremental messages that I should hate my body, be disgusted with my body, um, beat my body into submission and be quiet if somebody attacks my body um, and just be grateful that I still have my life. I, and, and as I look through these earlier works, I see that I was reckoning with this way of having, um, 
and never have been really being afforded as a little black girl a space to be innocent and a space to be fragile and therefore like not having um, this recognition that as a little black girl, I should be protected, which is something I see in the world around me now. And that so much research has come out over the last 10 years about um, the bias that little black girls face, like, right, that, that, you know, if you put a four year old black girl in some images next to four year old girls uh, that are white girls or lighter skinned girls, you'll find that there's this way uh, that the research has shown that um, a sense of innocence and vulnerability is not being afforded to that little black girl in her body. So this way of working with innocence and thinking about rage, but also returning to the figure, um, the a place of peace to actually express rage and doing that inside of these earlier works. Um, and really needing the opportunity to express some very difficult things in the work because I realized it's not safe for me. It's not safe for me to speak these things out loud. So there's always this like sort of tongue in cheek cuteness in some of my earlier work, but there's also um, just that play of bringing the colors red, white, and blue back into the work and really being um, in a place where I'm critical of uh, of America and doing this in a way where nobody has really tried to kill me yet. So this is a self-portrait of my soul. So I'm just, I'm gonna take you through some earlier work and I'm working with what I began doing in my earlier work was building up a visual lexicon. So everything in the work means something. When I'm using guns in the work, it is actually to really uh, remove the sort of power of violence and the sort of gun fever from the image and the symbol of the gun and begin to use it as a weapon to destroy a lie. I think about how Dr. King said you could kill liars every day of the week, but how do you kill lies? And you kill lies by um, stealing their air with the truth and demolishing them with so much truth that they, they, they suffocate. And so I'm looking at um, all of the birds in this small work and birds for me mean liberty and the liberty the soul's right to breathe. So putting secrets inside of work, secret rage, things I could not express out loud in these earlier works. And this work, which is in the collection that's on the screen right now that you is in the collection at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art is really came to this place where I realized that um, some of the ideas that I was reckoning with and the things that were really real in my life and about having, about being deeply unsafe in my body, unsafe to uh, speak creatively, unsafe uh, to move fully and openly in my queerness that um, we were in a situation where the sort of psychosis of like white supremacist delusion was gonna become a public health crisis and had already been a public health crisis. And so this work like really um, sort of galvanized the, these sort of layers of trauma and layers of, of sort of what happens when you do not reckon with the wholeness of a story. So I'm gonna move through some of these really quickly and talk about how I went from making these small objects to wanting to have engagements with them that were not in galleries and not in museums. So I just started to take my artwork outside. I got a grant from uh, from an, a, a big foundation and I, I got a grant to do an artist residency on my own front porch because I wanted to see if it was possible, one, to game the foundation system and to not have to sort of play my work towards an RFP, but to see if I could get a foundation to fund me for doing what I was already doing right where I already was. So I pitched this idea to do an artist residency on my own front porch. <coughs> and then I started to just take my artwork outside and have my friends um, photograph me with it. Because when I what I found when I was down in my studio was that like, I found the language of love that is alive for my life. So what's your what's the language of love that is alive for your life? And are you centering that love in your life? And are you asking it to do things in your life? Because I felt like, like art really saved my life. Art kept me from killing myself. And so I wanted to see what else it could do. And so I brought it outside of the house and would have 
my friends photographing me on street corners. I would get my hair braided on somebody's front porch with a sculpture sitting next to me. And I would have the most amazing conversations and I would play it to the foundation. I would say, well, the entire neighborhood is the museum and the yard is the gallery and everything is available. And I think about how Anish Kapoor talked about how the next scale for sculpture, how the, the only place for art and sculpture to go is to this place of scale. And I said, what if my entire life is the scale? What if everywhere I go, I am activating a sculptural um, process in building relationships and moving through communities and my community and activating the power of love um, on the scale of nurturing. So the scale of nurturing for me is that it's right where you are. It's right where you are, right with what you have and investing your heart into it. The scale of nurturing. So people are always like, aren't you gonna scale this up? And I was like, the scale is enormous because it's the scale of life, but it's also the scale of life using the technology of love and the technology of nurturing. So this is my front porch in Homewood. So working on my front porch made that kids were started to come all over my porch all the time and I would give them art supplies and we would work together and people would drive by my house and they'd be like do you have a daycare and I'd be like what I don't have a daycare I don't really like kids like that but I would work on my front porch and give the kids in the neighborhood any of the old wood or slate from the roofs of the houses that were being demolished around and I would give them material to make art with while I was making my own art because I realized that um, the very best way for me to share what I loved and to share the power of art was to just the best way to make more love was to share these things so sharing at the scale of nurturing right where you are um, and so I started to really push myself into like, what is art and where can it go? And so there was a, there's a, you know, a lot of street death around. And so I started to make these signs, say, stop shooting me, love you again. A foundation gave me money for that. And I was like, this is the artwork and it will just live in all these yards and it will, that will be the museum space. But really I wanted to stop seeing small caskets somebody shot you know up the street like about a mile away from where I am mile and a half somebody shot and killed an 18 month old and the baby was in his his aunt's arms and it was the smallest casket I ever saw and I remember thinking I don't ever want to see this again and I don't want I don't like there was unfortunately you know so much stuff had happened that I started to make these signs and we moved from being on my front porch making art to having a house that we made art in. And um, what, I think it's really important for people to know that I'm showing you beautiful images of beautiful black children in states of joy making art, but this is not romantic, right? So this is a person, I blurred the picture, it's a person I know and they're in the street and they're dead. And this is outside the art house, the house where you would see a million stop shooting, we love you signs. And this has happened more than one time. So every image I show you of myself making art or children or my neighbors joyfully making art, it is so important to have a place in our own neighborhood where we can access without obstacle, um, the power of our own creativity, because we know science tells us um, what happens to you in the process of making. And so it's really important because we're able to access our own human technology as a healing mechanism, because it's very difficult to watch people die in the street. And it does not leave you very, it doesn't leave fast. And so pushing this place of centering my life around love and art and sharing and the power of art and asking the work to do something, right? So I can't talk about, I can't give, I can't ever talk about art. I can't give a talk about art and just talk conceptually about this ideas. This is about tension. This is about, um, this is about race and class. Like I can't ever distance myself from the living reality of things. So uh, there is this way that I'm centering love and centering art and that it is at the scale of my wholeness and at 
um, and, and using the technologies that are available to us in our human systems um, through the love and through the art and through the sharing. So really having to contend with a lot of street death. This is from my, this is an artwork that I made with my residency at the Pittsburgh Glass Center. And in this image, you can see there are, there are all these hand blown glass vessels. And inside of those vessels are the dreadlocks of one of my friends who is a black gay male family therapist. And I remember thinking, dude, you are so rare. And he cut off all of his locks. He said, Vanessa, do you want them? And I said, yes. And we hand glue vessels for every single one of the locks he cut off of his head and put them onto this power figure that is a Pieta. Um, and I think about that power and all that information, that loving, healing information that came from a really rare human being uh, that people can have access to this through just by, um, for me, the work is powerful just by dint of sight. By looking at it and being close in close proximity to it, it's doing what it needs to do. So looking at that Madonna, looking at me holding the figure into this Pieta, into this Madonna, into these Black Madonnas, and thinking about the Black Madonna that you first saw that my mother made, um, and looking at uh, a sort of history of cultures where you could uh, make power figures and you could make powerful art by applying the image of the Black Madonna to whatever you wanted her to do work in. And so I think about how um, in Haiti, there's a Black Madonna that just protects women who have been abused by their husbands. And so really putting that uh, like moving that idea through myself dimensionally, there's me, the figure, and then this is one of my neighbors who I turn into a Black Madonna, another one of my friends, because I'm thinking about the power of art, and um, I'm thinking about what, what it can do in a living way, like at the scale of nurturing, right where we are. So I would see my friends, um, this is after Mike Brown had been killed in St. Louis, and I was seeing my friends on the internet express a kind of despair, like a lot of black films, a lot of black men saying, man, I got to go to work today. People are talking about the baseball game and I can't stop thinking about this kid's body in the street and I don't want to go to work and I'm, I can't stop crying and nobody else around me is grieving. And so I, what I started to do was find those people on my, um, on social media and I would ask them to come to my house and I would make things for them. I would make clothes for them. I would do their hair, do their makeup and just have this loving, intimate moment where we were face to face and they're being loved and cared for in this creative environment and they are transforming themselves and they are inside of the love. They are actively inside of the love and it is helping them to be in their bodies in this world. Uh, so I'll share that a, a little bit more of that with you. And I, um, so this is another work that came from my residency with the Glass Center. And this work is actually in the collection of an NBA player who I was like, wow, this guy called you, like this man, NBA player called the Glass Center because saw this piece online somewhere. So it's in this um, basketball players collection but the first, I love the Pittsburgh Glass Center. So for y'all who have had been lucky enough to go to the Pittsburgh Glass Center, as a Black artist, as, um, as people come into their humanity, into it reconnecting to their humanity, into the humanity of other people, um, there have been all these sort of efforts at diversity, equity, and inclusion, and all these, all these ways of um, institutions that were PWIs recognizing that oh, our institution could be for everybody. And I would be a lot of times the guinea pig and I would be brought into these institutions and they would be like trying out some new programming to bring more black, brown people into their space or something. And I have been in spaces and been treated like with incredible violence from the institution themselves because they got a grant to do something, but they didn't do the work internally, right? To um, really make sure that either they're bringing in a whole bunch of black and brown children into their space, but they have shady docents or, you know, they just hadn't worked on the full culture of the institution. So I have been damaged by that process. Um, and so I go to the glass center and the first day I'm at the glass center, I bring a kid with me from the art house 
And while we're at the Glass Center, I get a call that the SWAT team is in front of her house and in front of my house. And, and it's really crazy. And people are calling me and they're saying, Vanessa, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm okay, but I have these people's child with me and I'm at the Glass Center. And I had to tell Heather from the Glass Center that there was like a really, there's a standoff situation. And I have this little girl and everybody at this house is being arrested. So Heather and the Glass Center people, like we just stayed there for hours and hours and hours. And I knew that the Glass Center was a special place when I was working with Jason Fork um, and Heather, who's the executive director of the Glass Center was carrying this little girl around on her back and just like carrying her around the Glass Center. And I was like, okay, this is a space where we'll be okay and we'll be safe here. Um, and like dimensionally safe, like we were safe in that moment, but it always let me know that this was a place that was in relationship with me as a human being first, not as somebody that they could take pictures of and show that you got black people at your space and doing all of that. So this work right here is about the first time that um, my first trip to the glass center. So I am going to move really quickly through, um, through some, uh, some last images. And I'm gonna look at the chat to see if anybody's asking questions. How large is that piece? <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that question a little while ago. If you wanna, um, my uncle is that same guy, gay dreadlocked therapist. Oh, what's up? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, healing. Um, how large is that piece? I, if I knew which piece you were talking about, uh, but I'm so glad that somebody else loves PGC. I, I appreciate that. So I am going to um, just take the chat off the screen and show you a few more images and show you some, some, my work, my most recent work. So I stopped making single discrete figures and began making entire communities of figures. This is an installation called I Come to Do Violence to the Lie. It's 31 figures. This is at the Wadsworth Anthenium, part of the Matrix exhibition. And um, it is this massive installation that um, has a soundtrack to it. All of my installations incorporate sound and light. And then they also, I also do like a whole accessibility box for people who might not be able to see or hear inside of the space. This is an installation called Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies. So I'm no longer making just one image. I'm really working in communities of images, in communities of, sorry, in communities of figures, because I think about that trick non hot quote that I just moved by really quick where, where he says, the next great revolutionary leader isn't gonna be a single person. It will be an entire community of people. And Sometimes We Cannot Be With Our Bodies is, a work that um, celebrates and honors the lives of Black trans people. And I made this the year that um, 45 was inaugurated because by the time that inauguration came of 2016, there had already been so many Black trans women who had been murdered and so this is an installation and inside of my installations, just like with my sculptures, I'm putting secrets and surprises of wonder in there. So in my installations, there are oftentimes like performers who walk around and you don't know who they are until they start singing to the work and bringing ritual and community into the work and doing a series of rituals. And so I'm just gonna move through these really quickly. This is something that I do called the blue walk. It's a goodbye walk. This is in Omaha, Nebraska. We walked two and a half miles, which is the amount of time, the, the route that they dragged Will Brown's body. Omaha, Nebraska is where they say the largest race ride in American history ever happened. And so that installation, sometimes we cannot be with our bodies speaks to the way that, um, if any of you have had the misfortune to be on the street when somebody gets killed, if you're there with that body, the police will put you into the caution tape corridor and anybody else who comes after that, you can't get close to that body, right? Even if it's your person and you wanna touch them while they're still warm, um, you cannot be with that body. And I think about the ways like how Toni Morrison especially talks about in Beloved, how you would have to leave your body while um, horrible things were happening to your body and return to your body at another time. And, and, but also, you know, just so many writers have written about the destruction of the black body and, and recognizing that a lot of the trauma 
uh, trauma exists in our body, but it also exists on the land. So doing these ritual walks, this blue walk and bringing some of that trauma out of the land. Um, just gonna move through this really quickly. This is a sculptural incarnation of Washington crossing the Delaware. It's called Miracles and Glory Abound. It's an installation you can see on the wall. There's projection, there's sound that comes out of the boat. And it is um, one of the things that I'm thinking about in my work is whose imagination do we live inside of, right? Who gets to make the stories that we live by? Who gets to make the myths that become the heroic stories of our, uh, that we exist in, in this nation? Who gets to myth make into reality? And so this installation, Miracles and Glory, is a fictitious, it's a, it's a city park. It is, um, I call it the real, not real. Uh, so there are trees on the walls that are um, not real trees at all. They're not apple trees. They're trees of compassion or trees that you can weep underneath. Um, and this would be a city park and the central monument of the city park would be this monument, Miracles and Glory Abound. It's called, in this piece, it's called Laquisha Washington Crosses the Day Aware. And it is a theater of relief. And these are just some little girls at the museum in Flint, like posing like the figure at the front. So just coming through these ideas of love and sharing, this is the alleyway outside of my studio. It used to be called the Killing Fields because of um, how much street death happened there. Um, this is me doing the thing where I reach out to somebody through social media who's expressing despair, bringing them to my studio and making clothes for them, doing their hair, doing their makeup, and then parading them around the neighborhood. And what would happen when I would sort of do these photo shoots in my neighborhood is kids would just start to follow us and they would join us and they would ask a ton of questions and it would be this opening. It would be an opening to possibilities. And here's the art house. So that whole idea of love and share and human technology, which for me is creative understanding, redemptive, transformative goodwill. How do you really center that in your life in a world where things move so fast and there's so much data and um, so much distraction? So how do you center human technology? How do you center the capacity of your hands to reach out and, and to be in loving touch and relationship and creativity with your neighbors um, when, you know, especially when the world was more open. So this is the art house. The way the art house works is whenever the door is open, anybody can come in, a whole bunch of glass mosaic outside of the house. People would wait for the bus and they would work on the mosaic while they waited for the bus. So tons of people worked on this piece and they were super proud of it. The lady across the street's like 90 years old and she's like, I did that E, Miss Vanessa, show the people where my E is. Um, this is, and what I love about the art house is it's basically functions as an open studio. So whenever any, but the doors open, anybody can come in. This photograph was taken after the Pulse nightclub massacre, when churches were saying, you cannot hold that vigil here because God don't like gay. And so I said, we'll do something at the art house. And maybe 150 people came. This is like the largest group hug I have ever seen in my life. And I'm in the center of that circle. And this photographer from the newspaper shot this picture. And everybody, if you see people are holding white pieces of paper in their hands, we just came together. We said every name of everyone who was lost in that massacre. And then we sent light up into the sky for them. And we were able to do that because the art house is a space that exists at the scale of nurturing. It is a house, we took out some walls and because it's at the scale of nurturing, it can expand and contract like lungs and it can be what people need it to be. Like we're not, we don't have to worry about being on brand or off brand. It needs to be a space that is alive for people right now, right where you are. Um, so all of this work for me is the work of being a citizen artist. And this is my studio. I work in a very small space. Um, people can't believe that I made a 16 foot boat, 31 power figures in this space. Um, this is my most recent installation. It went up at the Frick. There are altars that began um, with me meditating on uh, the happenings, what happened to Breonna Taylor, George Floyd and Elijah McClain, which is so, it's like that devastation just rolls through. Like, I'm not the kind of person, I don't give myself permission to be like, oh, well, that happened over there. That happened to them. That's not my reality. Um, and so three altars. 
I'm using a lot of recycled glass and the aesthetic that I call this series of altars is like grandmother's living room, realness meets street corner memorial. Um, this is my grandmother's living room. And so my grandmother is showing us how she is curating beauty in her space, curating safety in her space, how she is making a space that rises up to meet her humanity with her own agency. And so this as a form of like creative practice as living room curation is really powerful to me and I honor it. And I honor it because it is, um, well, it, there are some places in your life that you're going to be able to make an ecosystem for yourself to be well in and some places you won't. So however we are able to do that, I honor it and I honor the technology um, that that rises from within ourselves. So that's my grandmother. Um, she's 94, born in a place called Mare Rouge, Louisiana. Um, the daughter of sharecroppers, formerly enslaved people. And this is a street corner memorial in the Killing Fields in my uh, in Formosa Way, which used to be called the Killing Fields. Somebody takes care of this memorial. It has been there for like 20 years. People are always adding things to it. It's about 20, 25 feet long. And I, I honor that this is a resource for people. It is meaningful, it is on purpose, and it does what it is supposed to do. I honor the place where that technology comes from. I honor the curation of this. I honor this assemblage for its deep resounding purpose. And so the work that you're about to see is called Grief and Light. And I'm thinking a lot about how do you grieve in this world um, when there's so much to grieve? Here's the work in completion. So Pittsburgh Glass Center custom made a lot of the glass in this work, which is these blooming trumpet mouth flowers that are about um, like eight to 10 inches wide that sort of push out from this waterfall of cobalt blue glass, some of which is found glass. There's about 400 milk of magnesia bottles on the George Floyd altar, which is the center altar. And I think about how, like I'm not a parent, but I think about how mothers I knew responded to him crying out for his mother so viscerally, like that how much it crushed them to know that he was calling out for a woman who had already passed. And so everything in the work means something. I use the cobalt blue in my work constantly. You saw it in the blue walk. Um, and one of the things I love about this piece is it really speaks to the important relationship that I have with Pittsburgh Glass Center and how that is a relation, it is a relationship of us being neighbors, right? And being um, in a place of radical empathy and deep purpose in that relationship. Uh, this is installation, it lives in a room in the Italian Renaissance Gallery at the Frick Art Museum. And it has a soundtrack that is the opera. It's the first and third movements of the opera, Unburied, Unmourned and Unmarked mixed in with the sound of my voice doing an it's an audio work called the attempt and it is the sound of me attempting to count to eight minutes and 39 seconds it takes me 10 minutes and 51 seconds to do that count and it's brutal and so there's a church pew and you can come into the space and um you can sit and you are invited to sit on this church pew for eight minutes and 39 seconds, eight minutes and 49, eight minutes and 46 seconds, 10 minutes, and to just have the space to feel and to be. And one of the things I'm thinking about and thinking about the power of art and, and places where um, there are places for art, I'm thinking about social healing. I'm thinking about how can institutions be part of making the world that we live in more livable by giving people the opportunity to have moments of real connection. Um, and, and, and I'm interested in if museums are able to create that sense of safety for people um, and what happens, you know, in this installation, we are directly inviting people to have a moment of healing. What happens? Do they take up on that? And so this work is not complete. This, 
um, one of the ideas that moves through this work for me is what is the opposite of a lynching? And this work will is on display at the Frick Art Museum, which is a mile away from my house. And it will have um, this, the next phase of, of grief and light is a 17 foot long neon sign that says, what is the opposite of a lynching? And that will be in Homewood, the hood, my neighborhood. And we will have a blue walk from that sign that says, what is the opposite of a lynching? While we are wearing the opera around our necks, we will wear speakers and we will wear the music and move with the cobalt blue up to um, the Frick, which is in a neighborhood that is completely different world than the world that I live in. So I want to thank you all for being so patient and such good listeners as I went through all of these images. I'm going to stop sharing screen right now and I want to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to look at the questions in the chat and then if anybody else has any other questions, you can let me know. Oh, the piece. So how tall is the piece with the glass objects and the dreadlocks? That work is about, it is like totally like 54 inches tall. Um, it's in a collection on the East Coast now. And I do believe that the collector has it, is using the bullseye glass crate with it also, which is what I had it on in the museum. I feel like I can feel the love and community wholeness through these photos. Hey, thanks, Olivia. I'm so glad. I'm like, I think that sometimes people come to talks and, or I have experienced this personally where I don't open my heart to what's happening. I'm like, look, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be here and taking this information. So I appreciate you opening your heart to that. You mentioned that all the materials, objects in your sculptures and installation have a specific meaning. What does glass have? So I'm using a lot of glass bottles in my work specifically. Um, and I can talk about the, um, I can talk about the other objects that are um, made in glass because you, I didn't get a close up, enough close up to the work, but also there, the glass center produced all of these custom butterflies for the Brianna Taylor piece. And um, so one of the ways I'm using glass is in relationship to the Golagichi, to the ideas of bottle trees and the glass vessel or a ceramic vessel on a grave that allows the spirit to rise up through that form and be cleansed as it makes its way into a next state of being and the bottle tree as a way to trap the evil spirit so that they could not um, come into your house. And for me, like what does glass mean in the work? There is the way that I am really interested in the transformation, like this technical transformation of the material and the material being moving through the furnace into a form and then holding form, right? So for me, that's very spiritual. And then there's, I love, um, I love community and being in community. And I love the process of making glass, how um, you can, you, you can make glass alone, you can, that can happen. But I love the community that lives, that is centered around blowing glass and blowing like these large scale projects. And so that, that the spirit of the material, right? Transforming through the furnace into object, holding its shape. Powerful. Thank you, Pearl Did Grandma look healthy and young. I'm gonna tell her you said that. How was art house impacted by the pandemic? I'm hoping that art love was still able to be lived. Well, I closed the art house during the pandemic. I, um, the art house is just the house, right? So this is not a large space, can't get a lot of space around it, but we have a big garden in the back. So the garden was active and I would just make creativity kits and put them on the front porch of the art house. And I said, anybody can take these. And what I loved was how many adults were like, Miss Vanessa, can I take these? You know, can I, I need, you know, because all of a sudden there were all these adults who were at home and had the opportunity to reconnect with that spirit of creativity that they loved when they were young. So I loved that. And um, then the art house caught on fire on, um, there's a fire at the art house on Valentine's Day. And so that just, 
is taking us to a whole nother place. One of our students is asking what inspired her to start doing her art. I was, um, I was raised by an artist. So there was never any not making art in my life. One of the ways that my mother kept us safe um, in LA, like in the eighties was that she would just put art supplies all over the dining room table and we would make things. So I didn't ever have this experience of where I came to art as a thing separate from my humanity and separate from the way that I lived and made my life. Like my mother made a lot of our clothes. We made our own toys. We made our own books. And so I grew up understanding that it wasn't this sort of flimsy hobby arts and craft, but that you were endowed by the creator with the capacity to create and to make the substance of your own life. And so there has been no separation uh, for me from the truth of that technology uh, my husband is from Pittsburgh, my in-laws, I saw that you experienced a fire, but I hope to visit. You'll be able to visit in the future. Blue seems important to my work. Blue is important to my work. Blue is, um, I think about the color blue as a gift. It's a gift. And then I'm ex experiencing it through this lens of past, present, future, political, cultural, and spiritual. So I'm thinking about what the color blue represents symbolically in the American flag. And so when I think about uh, the blue meaning glory, right? And I remember I got in trouble when I was like in the second or third grade for asking my teacher whose glory the flag was speaking to. And I was like, is it indigenous people? uh who's glory <laughs> you know and they i got called into the office they told me that i asked too many questions um and i'm also thinking about blue and the power of water the power of water to cleanse the power of water and baptism but also how water is the first medicine water connects us all we are mostly water and in in the um equivalence that i have between blue and water i'm also thinking about how in our wholeness, because I talked about that at the beginning, I'm looking at this in my wholeness, in our wholeness as human beings, being earthlings, there is something so magnificently specifically perfect about water and perfect, and, and perfect about the fact that the earth spins at 23 and a half degrees, right? Because we know that if the earth spun half a degree more, on that axis that water that we would be burnt up by the sun and water when it exists so i think about the nature of how perfect nature is and moves and that we're inside of that and are we do we have living structures that allow us to inhabit our nature and in the line of that perfection um so I'm also thinking about the blues. I'm thinking about Ma Rainey, um, who they call the mother of the blues, but she, she, she says, I stole the blues from a little girl, from a 14 year old girl who sang at a, um, at a tent revival. Um, but I think about how Ma Rainey said, she said, you know, people think, you know, specifically she was like, white people think we just sing the blues, that the blues are just a song, but, but they're not. They're not a song. The blues is a way of singing something out of your body. It's a way of making more space. And so I think about having, um, accessing the technologies already within our beings to contend with the shape of the world that we have for ourselves to live in, right? And to have access to that healing because we know like healing is only in relationship to harm, right? And so having access to that healing for this sort of rolling continual harm that comes when you um, live on a land that is structurally and strategically unjust, right? So talk about more about dimensional safety. So I'm thinking about spiritual safety, intellectual safety, physical safety, and I'm thinking about how the, um, sort of structures that we have for safety in the world, this Western world are often 
um, structures that do the opposite of safety. And so dimensional safety through my work, um, if I just look at those earlier works where I'm Look, where I'm thinking about the innocence of the Black body and the fragility and the vulnerability of the Black body in, in its wholeness, the Black body being destroyed for uh, breathing in the front seat of the car, the Black body being destroyed for, think about Renisha McBride knocking on the door and asking for help, being destroyed for asking for help, Tamir Rice's little Black body being destroyed for playing using his imagination as K.A.C. Lemon says in a city park. And so that dimensional safety for me is making, um, asking the work to make spaces where we are safe in our imagination. We're safe in our softness. We are to meant to be safe, to be soft, which really is some, it can be such a painful place for me in that work I showed you that's at the Frick because I think about Elijah McLean having the language within him to tell the police, I'm an introvert. I have, I, I do not do violence. I don't even hurt flies. I'm a vegan. Would you please respect my boundaries? So thinking about him not being safe to be soft and not being safe to move with tenderness in his own body and making work that addresses those things, having the opportunity to speak them out loud because perhaps some people didn't think Oh yes, Tamir Rice was a child who was shot and killed 1.2 seconds at a city park where he was using his imagination. Shouldn't children be safe to use their imagination in the city park? Um, and so it's something that I uh, think about all, I, I think about all, often what are, what is, what is an ecosystem of safety? Does anybody else have any other questions? Vanessa, I, I have one, uh, Georgia. Are you Georgia? I, um, your, your messages were thought provoking and it took my mind on a journey, especially because of the numerous objects on each piece. And I was wondering if every object has a meaning for you and also on one of the early pieces, you showed uh, uh, one that had a lot of keys and locks. And my mind went to uh, different places there about opening up and unlocking pieces of my life and things of that Woo! nature. So I just wondered, you know, um, I, I've looked at a lot of artwork, but many times it's just one piece. But your work has a lot of objects and it can take the mind on a journey. So talk to me a little bit about that. So the first thing that I'll talk about is the accumulation. You're saying a lot of objects. And so, you know, when I was speaking at a university on the East Coast, their sculpture professor said, I, you know, they were like, shouldn't you, your work be more refined? And I said, like, what makes you think it's not refined, right? Like whatever's there is there and it's on purpose. The accumulation exists one as an aesthetic expression of the accumulation of, of um, moments in life and situations and circumstances and statistics that weigh on the body. So the fact that the bodies are weighted with this accumulation of objects is a, is a physicalization of this experience that the body you know, has in, in the world. And every object means something. Um, and I'm drawn to every object for a reason. I think about how Betty Saar and Alison Saar talk about being called to objects and being drawn to objects. Um, I'm drawn to objects, I'm called to objects. And then I have a revelatory process where I'm in relationship with this object, with this material in my studio, and I'm listening to it. I'm listening to what it's drawing up inside of me. And then I'm having moments of clarity with these objects and using them as language in an accumulation on a figure. So when I say that everything means something, everything's there for a reason. So on Power Figure to Keep Me Alive, there was a broken string of glass pearls. And so when I think about 
when I'm using pearls in a piece, I'm using it in, and every object exists for me in this strata, past, present, future. So the simultaneity of time and political, cultural, spiritual. And so pearls for me are like a real string of pearls is an object that is luxurious. It's jewelry that is luxurious, but it's also jewelry that came from the ocean. It came from the sea. It came from a creature that made that pearl inside of a home that keeps it perfectly protected and perfectly safe. But I also am thinking politically about do not cast your pearls before swine. And I'm also thinking about the way that my grandmother would say, oh, you make me clutch my pearls. Like you have done a shameful thing or you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You make me clutch my pearls. And so bringing into that way that um, how, you know, through some older generations, I was, you know, they taught me the lessons that they were taught about their body, that you should be ashamed of your body and that you should hold your body tight in this place of control. Um, but the key specifically, I live in Pittsburgh where August Wilson is from. And I think about August Wilson's play, Gym of the Ocean, and how Aunt Esther, whose name really means ancestor, you know, one of the things she tells citizen is that you, like, you have to forgive yourself and how August Wilson talked about how forgiveness is the key. And so when there are keys in my work and they're on this accumulated body, this body that is bearing so much weight, those keys release and open a place of, of forgiveness so that some of the weight, the weight that needs to leave can go, right? And so the keys are to unlock a place of internal forgiveness so that one can forgive themselves for betraying your soul or you can forgive yourself for whatever and have that release and there's so many keys in a lot of the work because there are so many ways that um we have like accumulated and i'll speak for myself that i would have that i have accumulated self-loathing that i accumulated shame that i accumulated these ideas that were really um damaging to myself and punished myself for things so that's internal forgiveness that i need so internal forgiveness external forgiveness with the keys anytime there are spoons in the work it speaks to the power of being spoon fed how at some point in your life if somebody did not feed you by hand, you would not have lived. And what kind of love is that? And I'm thinking about the technology of love that is instinctive to the human animal to keep your offspring alive, but also to work to move intentionally in that act from spoon feeding from the bowl to you and back again. So spoons in the work are always that deep animal uh, original truth of the house of love inside of the earthling human animal being activated. Everything means something. So there are sometimes, Georgia, that if I'm at a museum and I'm doing a talk, I will do a reading of a piece. And a reading of a piece is a poem. It is a spoken word poem that consists of all of the physical material that you see, all of the objects that you can physically see in the artwork and the invisible material, which is the situation, the circumstance, the history and the future history that the work is, um, that is in the ecosystem of the work. And so I can perform, I'm a performer and I can perform the artwork by listing the ecosystem of material that makes up that work. Thank you. Your explanation took me on another journey. <laughs> it is good to journey. Journeys are good. I, I love a journey. Does anybody have any other questions? I know that we're past time, but we're right on time, but past time at the same time. Maybe if, not. All right. But Thank Vanessa. You. See you guys. Thank you. Oh, is somebody there? Yeah. Yeah, it's me, Dora. I'm sorry. See you guys. See you guys. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you so you much. All. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for, thank you so much for sharing your work and yourself with us. So good. I was getting um, texts the whole time from people that are, that, are in, that are in the meeting that were like, <sighs> um, you know, everybody is feeling what a gift 
um, you and your work are. And I am also, like many of the people that were writing me, on the verge of tears because you know I'm a feeling person too, but you have, exactly. I know what work it is to share as much as you have. Thank you. Really Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Can you. I send you off all well with wellness and love from my heart of peace to your heart and to all of the artists out there. I um, send you courage and love and endurance and a sense of peace and grace for your practice and for your dimensional self and giving another special shot of love out to people who are teachers. Thank you to all of the teachers and to all of our educators who are bringing us into connection with ourselves and with so many things that are alive in the world. So thank you all so much and everybody have a wonderful evening. Thanks everybody at the corny. Thank you so much, Susie, you're dope. <laughs>